players were war gamers who were heavily interested in vast, sweeping campaigns of nation versus nation. <laughs> Hey, Wargamers, welcome back. Purple Druid here with another campaign design discussion. And today we are going to talk about the origin and the inspiration for the Shadow over Shoyenka campaign. A brief discussion that I had with some of my players um, regarding how the campaign is going. So let's, let's go. I want to give you a little bit of an abstract first. Uh, this is basically a recapitulation of the text in the post that this video is attached to. So bear with me. I am not going to just read it because I will be elaborating on some of the topics that I covered. Uh, like I said, this was a brief abstract that I shared with the players prior to our discussion about the campaign. So just a little background. Uh, back in 2021, I had started an old school campaign based on low fantasy gaming, which went on for a little more than two years. Uh, just around that time, I had reread the Fred Saberhagen novels uh, of the Empire of the East, and I was very interested in trying to develop a new magic system based on these stories. And the World of Wirth campaign was intended to be a playtest system, or a playtest vehicle, I should say, for this magic system. Now, of course, Goodman Games had released a Kickstarter, and they did an Empire of the East supplement for DCC, which I was really excited about. Um, but when it came, I was I was disappointed. I think it could have been a lot more than it was. Uh, I don't think they really delved into the background of the setting and conveyed the feel of, of those books. I just, I was really disappointed in that. So I went ahead and continued to do some research, continued to do some campaign building, um, and looked at different game systems. I had chosen low fantasy gaming because it was not Dungeons and Dragons. And I think this is really a, an important point because I wanted the game to feel more sword and sorcery in a strange world. I didn't want to do the standard knights and wizards in a fantastic Western Europe. I wanted to get away from that Western Europe or Lord of the Rings kind of mindset that I think a lot of people assume when they play Dungeons and Dragons. I wanted a setting that felt different. I wanted a setting that played different. And low fantasy gaming was designed to be that kind of sword and sorcery game. Um, I also rearranged the landscape. I put the climate differently so that it was more uh, equatorial or more, I shouldn't say equatorial, I should say more uh, Mediterranean. Um, I was really, really pushing to get away from that standard wizard, thief, fighter, cleric mindset that Dungeons and Dragons can engender. I do fully understand that you can do lots of genres and lots of settings with Dungeons and Dragons, but in order to break that mold, I chose a different rule set. And I think it worked and it was popular enough with the players that they decided to just keep on going and play it as a full on campaign. And this campaign lasted for over two years. And it was, I think it was very successful. I had a lot of fun doing it. And players certainly had fun because they kept coming back, which is how you win at, uh, at role-playing games. So while the campaign continued, I continued to do research and more campaign preparation. And I was really digging into the history of Dungeons and Dragons. I was studying the Appendix N books I was studying old war games like Chainmail and Tony Bath's Ancients and Tony Bath's How to Set Up a War Games Campaign. I really wanted to get a feel for what the gameplay would have been like back in the 70s. I wanted to know and understand what those players and game masters knew and understood 
as a foundation for what it was that they were playing because they weren't just playing, you know, fighters and wizards. They were playing barons. They were playing powerful, you know, there was a vampire character who led his own faction in the dungeon. Um, and I'll pause right here and mention, if you have not seen the Secrets of Blackmore movie, you need to go see that uh, that documentary. It is absolutely fascinating, and it will give you a lot of insight as to how the game was played at the beginning and what some of the underlying assumptions were when it came to playing Dungeons and Dragons. So to get back on track, uh, like I said, I wanted to get a feel for what the gameplay would have been like with participants who were avid war gamers. And this is the most important thing, and I know I bang around on Twitter about this, but the players were war gamers who were heavily interested in vast, sweeping campaigns of nation versus nation, army versus army. They were used to playing and replaying Napoleonic style campaigns and medieval campaigns real war game campaigns, map-based campaigns, where you move your armies around on a strategic map, and when they clash, you move to a tactical map and you play the battle. That was the kind of game, that is the kind of game that I'm looking for, and I am searching for the principles, the replicable principles that can be used to recreate that sort of campaign. I will also throw out that there was a lot of encouragement and prodding and arguing with people like Jeff Rowe Johnson and John Mollison, Mr. Wargaming, about the hard to understand parts of the game. And the research led me to understand that parts of the game that seemed to be missing were built on wargame campaign principles that Gary and Dave assumed participants would understand because they had been playing this way for years. And three of the most important principles are <clears throat> that the game is based on strategic map level movement and timekeeping. The timekeeping moves at a fixed and predictable pace. Number two, they were interested in domain level play featuring politics, trade, diplomacy, and army scale conflict. And then the third principle it comes from the second principle where they all understood the basic concepts of mass combat, such as formations and morale and movement and uh, maneuvering large units of soldiers on a tactical map. So this all led to my deciding to transition the campaign from what we had been doing, which was the conventional pause time, to... 1-1 one, one downtime pacing. And I have chosen that expression specifically rather than just one-to-one -one timekeeping for two reasons. One, it should be less ambiguous as to when the one-to-one -one tracking with the real world calendar takes place. It takes place in between sessions. And I'm not going to suffer the conversation with people that say, oh, if it takes 10 minutes to search a piece of wall, what, are we going to just sit there for 10 minutes? No, that's stupid. Don't, don't, don't be like that. One-to-one -one downtime pacing puts your campaign into a strict timekeeping format where time passes at a uniform and predictable rate. It prevents problems that occur when players can't make it to a session. It prevents problems that occur when party travels for a long way and spends a lot of time in one particular session <clears throat> and then now they're a month in the future because they've been traveling for four weeks and you have left behind all of the other things that are going on in the background of your campaign and so as dungeon master when that session ends and a month has passed and you're going to play again next week you have to go back and you have one week to figure out what all the other factions all the NPCs, all the countries and nations and you know barons and what have you have been doing for that past month to advance their own plans, you know, to work on their own goals. Because even if you don't have patrons or downtime players in your game, you do have kings and barons and 
merchants and thieves guilds and what have you, right? You have those things. And those people don't just sit there, you know, on pause, like some kind of animatronic waiting for the players to interact with them. They have their own goals. They have their own activities that they're working on. And those things continue to happen no matter what the players are doing. And so if your players travel for a month during a session and get way out into the future, well, you know what? That's what happened today on March 2nd. They're not going to be able to play again until April 2nd. So they're going to need to play some different characters next week. And I, as the dungeon master, can continue to manage and determine the activities of the downtime players or the patrons or the NPCs, whatever you want to call them, however they work in your game. But they keep doing things. No matter what the players are doing, the world keeps moving. And that's the most important thing about one-to-one -one downtime pacing and how it can dramatically change the way you look at your campaign and the way that your players will interact. Now, in the fall of 2022, it was announced that there was going to be an inexpensive soft cover version of the Tannisborg Mega Dungeon uh, released on pre-order. So I went ahead and grabbed that and I put out a couple of tweets that I was going to run a Mega Dungeon campaign based on Tannisborg. It would also incorporate concepts from Chainmail and from Tony Bass New Games campaign. And when I received the book in March of 2023, I tweeted an invitation to anyone, literally anyone on Twitter who wanted to play in this kind of game with the specific intention of using two intertwined philosophies, the so-called bro SR principles, like multiple characters for each player and one one downtime pacing, and the second principle of war game campaign play with factions and starting domain level play at low levels and using large numbers of men at arms in regular session play. And the idea was how can we incorporate those two principles into a method and find the best practices for running a mega dungeon centered game? Because lots and lots of people in the wargaming, or I should say RPG community, were insisting that a mega dungeon centered game would not work with one to one downtime pacing. And so I wanted to figure out how to make that work. Uh, I wanted to use old school rules in order to simulate the play environment of the original 1970s participants. Now, Tannis Borg comes with a set of rules. It's called Zero Edition Dungeoneering, but they were not available separately. And so I didn't want to be the guy who scanned those rules and put them online. And, uh, you know, I don't, I, I'm not into putting out NDAs and things like that. You know, if people are going to use a resource or do whatever they want, they're going to do whatever they want. Because they weren't available separately, I decided to pick a rule set that was available. So the next option for a proto Dungeons and Dragons was Champions of Zed. But that was also long out of print, and the author has no intention of re-releasing it, either in print or in PDF. So because I wanted to make this campaign fully public, I wanted to avoid any of these kind of copyrights or ethics issues. So this led me to use Blue Home, which is free for the first three levels and very inexpensive for PDF or print for the expanded version that goes up to level 20. So if the players decided to continue beyond it, they could invest in the game itself, get the rules, um, and we would use that. Now, in retrospect, maybe I should have used a different set of rules. Maybe I should have used OD&D. Maybe I should have used AD&D. However, I still would have run into the same problem of incompleteness that I encountered um, months later. Now, starting the campaign, the response to my invitation was so great that I had to set up two sessions a week in order to accommodate all the players. Uh, my Thursday group, they were very excited about delving into Tannisborg, and so we put the Weir, uh, World of Weirth campaign on hiatus and switched over. 
and both session groups <clears throat> dove into Tonisborg with aggressiveness. They discovered it was hellishly dangerous and that there were strings attached to the treasure they recovered. Now, in, again, in retrospect, I think keeping the taxation concept was a mistake, but I was trying to recreate a lost game form and I wanted to stick to what was in the rule book, but I did not anticipate the pushback. Now, it's been said many times that players will go to insane lengths to avoid paying taxes. And I've seen, I've seen it before, but I'd forgotten, and I saw it again here. So both session groups kind of lost interest in Tonisborg almost immediately because they just didn't see the return on the investment. Now, the Thursday group decided what they would do was look into other opportunities in the region so they could earn enough golden experience to level up a bit before going back into Tonisborg. Um, primarily because in their first delve, they ran into some giant ants with five hit dice that wiped out half their party. And then they went back again, trying to avoid them and ran into a kobold warren and lost a couple characters, or at least one character there. Um, and were not able to penetrate the kobold lair due to the traps. So again, they decided to go back out and seek their fortune elsewhere. Now, the Tuesday group did a similar thing, but they soon veered way, way off into what was, I felt, completely unexpected direction. And so I have asked the Tuesday group to participate in a short chat, which is coming right up where we're going to discuss uh, six questions. And those questions are, what was your initial impression of how you thought participation in this campaign might unfold? Number two, did you have any idea of win conditions when you started? Number three, what caused you to discard the concept of studying Mega Dungeon play for what you wound up doing, which was creating a significant faction? Question four, how would you describe the impact of one-to-one -one downtime pacing on the development of your faction and nascent domain as compared to conventional pause time play? Well, that's a mouthful, but they have some very, very good answers. Um, question five, have your ideas regarding win conditions changed over the past year? And question six, what is the most compelling aspect of this particular game for you? Um, so those are the questions, and we'll get into that in just a little bit. It is about 30 minutes coming up, so if you want to grab a cup of coffee and a notebook and settle in, I do look forward to any questions or comments you may have. Please feel free to type them into the little box down below. And as always, hit like and subscribe and uh, get involved with the ongoing development of this type of game mode. So without further ado, the conversation with the Tuesday session. We'll go from there. So thanks for doing this, first of all, guys. I appreciate it. And I guess the first thing I would throw out is, having read the abstract, did you have anything you wanted to add or comment on that prior to um, going through the short list of questions? Uh, I think the questions cover most of uh, most of what we probably have to say about it. Um, outside of the the overall conversation that's been had a hundred million times, and I'm tired of repeating myself. If people can't get a hold of uh, if people can't get a hold of one one time in their brain now, I I, I can't help them. Correct. Okay, so let's. I guess we'll start with number one. Um, what was your initial impression of how you thought participating in this campaign might unfold? You can take it away in any order you would like. Uh, well, um, I thought initially uh, that we'd, you know, be in the Tonisborg dungeon and and we'd be playing Blue Home Raw, and uh, you know, competing with the environment. And particularly with um, the other um, party of PCs and patrons that we knew to be in the game, um, that that was my my first thought. 
what I thought I was getting into. It was it was interesting uh, because the the, the primary uh, draw was that there would be uh, multiple actors all within the, the same area. Uh, yeah, for for me, there was a, a a miscommunication that transpired where you had pitched this game to everybody as as Tonnisberg faction play. Uh, but when you pitched that, you made a critical error in that you put up a picture of Tony Bath's book on wargaming campaigns. <laughs> and I latched onto that with a vengeance. And so from jump, I had thought this campaign was going to be get into the dungeon, get a little bit of scratch, hire an army, and start throwing it around. Um, and and build an army from the ground up so that you kn- so that I had a better idea of how to build armies whole cloth when I had to do that in in other games, and I had a better idea of how to use the army that I had because at every stage we would be we would be testing this army in the field and getting feedback on on our tactics and on its composition. Uh, for me. From from the word go, that was the plan, and that that controlling idea of you know a race to the heavyweight status determined the sorts of objectives that we would pick and the way in which we would evaluate the the victory condition we had. Yeah, for me, um, I was brought in a little after start, so it's uh, it's. My initial impression was I was being brought in to be a little bit more of a chaos engine to help move things along and um, and motivate things. Uh, So my initial impression of this was to come in and, you know, let's win. And uh, hopefully I was selected properly for that uh, attitude. And it's it's coming to play, I believe. But it's one of those things is uh, finding things to to leverage in a campaign to succeed is important and i i feel it's more of a mindset that uh every party at least needs one person that's gonna push everybody else over the uh, ledge i i hope i've been doing that well enough you have i would definitely say that you have been uh cranking the volume up definitely (laughs) okay so that all that makes that all makes perfect sense. So, when you, <clears throat> I think you've kind of addressed the idea of win conditions. But was there anything more specific you wanted to say about win conditions? Well, we knew when we started. Um, the only thing we knew when we started was Bellic and I, who are, you know, familiar with each other from other games and stuff. We knew that we were going to be players. We didn't really know anybody else in the game, or at least I didn't. Um, but we we anticipated. Um, player versus player, player versus patron uh, activity. Uh, we set our sights on a specific target. Um, and so from the get-go, before the game ever started or we even rolled characters, we knew what our win condition was. Now, you know, of course, traditionally, tabletop role-playing games, they don't have a, a quote-unquote win condition that's not a, you know, there's not a there's not an end state. Um but for us, we definitely had an overarching objective. We, we came into the game with that. Okay. And so I think that leads us right into, <clears throat> excuse me, number, <clears throat> excuse me. I think that leads us right into number three. Um, what caused you to, I use the word discard the concept, but maybe it's better to just say move it away from. Um, but in any case, what caused you to discard the concept of studying the mega dungeon play um, and instead focus in on creating a significant faction? Well, uh, we knew we were going to create a faction going in. Uh, we, Like Bellic uh, said, we, we were very interested in uh, building an army and building a domain and, and organizing that from the ground up and uh, being on the same page, doing it uh, – collaboratively uh where it's where you're not constantly fighting amongst each other for resources and things like that where that that kind of stuff gets bogged down um so we knew 
uh, that we were going to do that. What was surprising to us um, was the our first adventure was so profitable, uh, and it was also relatively frustrating uh, in that in that dungeon. Um, what with surprise taxes and and stuff like that, and we ended up with enough uh, liquid wealth to kind of jumpstart our ability to expand. Uh, so we were able to we were able to get away from what we felt was, or at least what I felt uh, was going to be uh, a battle that we didn't want to fight uh, with tax collectors and and avoiding and smuggling and and you know that kind of thing that wasn't the battle i was looking for um i was looking to compete with other uh players um so once once we got that big score we didn't really see a need to go in there and risk dying uh you know uh, every session and maybe we didn't get enough time to to learn about the factions and stuff within the dungeon um you know that that's certainly possible uh so uh, it, that was that was really the primary reason, at least for me. Um, it, we got a bunch of money, and we didn't have to deal with the tax men anymore if we just got away from the city. So yeah, that, that's that what makes, we did. That makes sense, absolutely. Because, yes, you did have a very profitable first adventure, um, much more so than the Thursday group did with their first uh, experience. Um, I, and- I would also say that I've, I've learned throughout the campaign, I don't particularly care for Blue Holmes simplicity in the in its, you know skirmish of the rules um which we push the boundaries on pretty quickly by generating men at arms and and all that kind of stuff where we're now we're more into you know chain mail and axe kind of kind of mechanics um but the the statistical uh, abilities of of characters at the you know at the party level the adventurer level are uh, they're not that interesting to me there's just not very much going on all the weapons do the same damage you don't get any bonuses for your stats uh, it's all uh, it's a it's a little too bare bones uh, for my taste okay fair enough I, th- I think in addition to the the liquid wealth that we got the analysis that we had done on the return on investment for hitting that dungeon again um, because it wasn't simply that we were making 63 coppers for every gold piece that we hauled out it's that we were paying I think five gold a head to get guys in or, or some number of gold per head to put fellas into the dungeon and we were interested in racking up a lot of bodies behind us and if we were going to have troops we were going to use troops. We weren't going to let them sit around uh, soaking up cash we didn't have. And the for us, there was always going to be more elbow room on the hinterland, on the frontier. That was we, where we were going to be able to develop our army and our ability to use our army without bumping into the... Um, the governmental oversight or or the other factions that were located in the city that we might have have otherwise come to blows with yeah that makes perfect sense that makes perfect sense um <clears throat> all right so number four and i know this question is was hashed over quite a bit recently but basically, um, your impression on how would you describe the impact of the one-one pacing methodology on the development of your faction and nascent domain, as compared to your experiences with conventional pause-time play? Well, um, let me think. So, uh, the simplest way to put that um, is that time is a resource, and if time is paused then the resource is wasted. Um, there's a lot of theoretical, oh, well, you could do this with stop time and you could do, you can't, you can't do it the way that you want to do it with several independent human controlled, uh, you know, factions and keep everybody on the same schedule by pausing time and advancing time all willy nilly. Uh, I think uh, B-dubs and Jeff Rowe call it yo-yo time. Um, you can't, you can't do it that way. You have to have it fixed to a calendar so that everybody knows when 
things are happening. They know how long it's going to take them to move troops or, or you know, steal the princess or, or bribe the guard or uh, build an army. Uh, they, they, they have to know um, all that stuff, and that gives them the flexibility uh, to act on their initiative rather than waiting for the DM to give them permission to say, okay, now what do you want to do? Uh, you need that. You need to know. You need to know the framework. You need to know the rules that you're working within in order to uh, advance uh, in the ways that we were looking to. Um, so we were able to set our objectives and put a timetable on them, um, both both in game and out of game. That gave us the ability to be successful, or at least as successful as we have been. I am um, you know, listening to everything that everybody talks about on one one time and pause time play. I feel everybody is missing the boat when they have their conversations. And I think there's blatantly obvious points that everybody's sidestepping. You you get all this mess, these people arguing and saying horrible things to each other about, you know, the, the, how how players are supposed to interact and everything. But most of the th- like I see one one pacing as being important on developing faction and patron play, which I think is more important than the other things. So everybody, everybody talks about how one, one time so much better, but it's only enriched when you have third parties as basically commanding the NPCs of your world. When you have a patron or another faction that is actively acting towards things that is competing against you, if they're, you know, if they're an adversarial or even if they're helpful and you could recruit them and interact with them, the one one time, the most important aspect of it is it sets both of you on the trajectory on a, a level p- playing field. And everybody always talks about how it's, you know, pause time, you, you don't get the opportunity to use a resource or this, that, the other. But really, it's resources against other factions, resources. Uh, when you start playing with the economics, these systems like Axe or what we've put together with this game, um, we have to compete economically against our adversaries. And then, of course, they have time to, to put things into play. If, if a goblin lord is going to dispatch ants and that takes a certain amount of time to dig out a tunnel, it's important for how things interact with us and how their resources are being spent compared to us. And as soon as you have that, when you have the patron play, you have the other, other things in the world that are outside of the DM's control because other people are controlling them, that's what really makes the game interesting and impactful to me is the idea that I have a real opponent that is working against the same odds I am, and it's a competition. Um, the DM can always win. We know that, right? Like, you don't like to show up late. If you do show up late, you bring some like, offering to the DM because if they just want to drop an uh, uh, ancient dragon on you, they can just do it, right? Like, everything can end instantaneously if you're actually competing against the DM. But when you have the patron play aspect, you're competing against somebody that has the same rules as you. And how you play that game really focuses on the fact that D&D is a war game. You're using your resources to attack other people and move through things. Everybody that seems to support pause time play is very much on, I'm the DM and I'm in absolute control and everything I say is, is, is whatever. And that's great if you really want that level of control in the world. But when you have that level of control, you know how it ends. Um, I've done DMing and stuff with pause time play before we really came into the one, one time before bro SR took over my gaming groups. Cool. No matter how much time and effort you put in, you put in all the preparation, you do everything you can as a DM your players are in a fishbowl of your design, and it's going to end how you imagine it to end, not how they do. There is no freedom. There is no actual control of resources. When it comes to one one time, it's the great leveler. And then when you add in faction play and patrons, you create a diverse world that people play for years, interacting with each other on their own time, dealing with things, making transactions, making plans. Um, linking up armies to go and knock down another patron, you become the game becomes so much more diverse, and and the depth play gets added so much, and all of it is because pause time. Ultimately, the DM owns everything, and no matter how good of a job they do, Matt Mercer knows how the story ends. Players can do what they want. 
Absolutely. And Matt, Matt Mercer, what game does he play in? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm not supposed to name drop him. That's all right. That's all right. He plays. He, he has an internet show, some kind of web show where they. Uh, it's got a bunch of actors. That. Oh, what's the best way to put this? It's Seventy years they, ago, it would have been a sitcom act, on radio. The same they, difference. They are playing the role of characters in a TV show that are playing Dungeons and Dragons. Very meta, but I will also say this regarding that your t- your take on the one one pacing and the resources and the competition between parties and patrons. Um, I'm glad that I did the campaign prep that I did prior to starting the game. But both you guys on Tuesday night and the Thursday night group have both gone in different directions. It's like running two separate campaigns, even though you guys are, you know, running around in this on the same map. Because just the way that you're taking the, the ways that you two groups take advantage of their situation. It's just it's completely different. And personally, I find that fascinating. And while I am a little bit disappointed that we didn't um, go ahead and, and turn it into how does one one pacing work with Mega Dungeon Exploration, which I can, we can do that another time. Um, I'm fascinated by the direction it has taken. Uh, I'm fascinated by how the faction and the army that you have developed um, has gotten the attention of the people that were playing patrons at the beginning and some of them uh, felt like they didn't have the time to put in to develop their own factions during downtime. Um, Some of the others and some new ones are leaning into it as well. And so there's a, there's a lot of things going on in the background. And so I'm having a great time, I guess, you know, taking what I'm learning from you and by you, I just mean that all the, all the participants and then spending my so-called prep time, reconciling all that information and then doling the information back out as it's appropriate and and during the time i mean i have a notebook that i keep here it's a it's basically it's a calendar and so as as things are happening i have to write them down because sometimes people do things in advance like your group and what have you um and so then i i can't release some information until you know the 24th and then the 26th and then the 27th um so i i think it's absolutely fascinating what uh, what is happening here. Um, question number five: Have you, any of you had your ideas change regarding the wind conditions that you had imagined at the beginning? Uh, I I personally haven't. Uh, I think as a group, um, we started uh, with a firm idea of our our uh, wind con. Um, we had some players kind of come and go. Uh, but um, I think when Finn joined us, uh, he he knew that we had an objective, and he was he was on board with that. And so, um, you know, our the objective may have shifted um, in in subtle ways, uh, but it never changed the fact that we knew we had a goal, and that's every session, every every resource, every every decision is based on achieving that goal. Excellent, excellent. And I guess this is um, question number six, the last question. This is uh, kind of a, a grade because I, I know you know I, I grade all the players. Um, I shouldn't say that. I, should, I grade all the characters. Um, but... <laughs> we grade the players. You grade the characters. <laughs> <laughs> what is the most compelling aspect of this particular game for you? And I guess you know, like, what keeps you coming? Back? I mean. It's it's easy. It's far out ahead. The second place ain't close. It is this team in particular, um, which which sets objectives, which pursues objectives, which 
uh, considers our performance and adjusts the, the preparation we do for our next session accordingly. Uh, it's a lean, mean team. 100%. It's the... I uh, I put out a, a relatively long uh, Twitter thread um, a couple of months ago, um, and I, I've since posted it uh, to my blog. But the um, I view uh, these types of games as a team sport, um, where when the session comes around and everybody agrees to sit down to the table, you need to have an idea of what you're doing, and you need to be everybody needs to be on the same page trying to get that thing done. Now, within that framework, there's all manner of opportunity to play your role, and the role that I'm speaking of is your role as a as a fighter or a mage or a thief, uh, cleric, whatever. Uh, that's the, you know, there's there's plenty of opportunity for you to find uh, ways uh, to fit within that that framework, while also achieving the objective that you set forth. Um, the best example that I know of that is uh, Fluid the Druid uh, in Julopolis. Is, uh, he frequently plays um, characters that I would describe as you know, shit disturbers. Um, but he's never... He's always going to play his role, but he's, he doesn't... He does it within the appropriate framework. So as his thief or or whatever, he'll he'll try to steal the thing or he'll try to you know he'll try to pull a joke or a prank or something. But he always does it in a way that we we can still get the job done. Um, and I I I think it if you view it as a team sport, uh, then I think this group that we have here uh, is exemplary in that we we all take it in that light. And, uh, and we can we can succeed because of that. And that's just like Bellic said, it's it's the team where uh, the ability for us to scale up uh, what we've done so far um, together and, and you know, uh, kind of agree. Uh, even when we disagree, we can come to an understanding uh, that I've never had that in a game before. And it's uh, it's 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 a lot of fun. Awesome. And I would like to agree with that too. This this team, I think we got a very <laughs> focused view of what our goals are, and um, I think everybody works really hard towards that direction. That look, you had, you had something. You were about to speak. No, I was just going to say that you didn't have to say it was the team if you didn't want to. I didn't want to peer pressure you. <laughs> no, yeah, 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 me too, guys. It was, it was a team. <laughs> Doesn't have to be a mutual admiration society, even though it is. Well, you guys saw my uh, my answers uh, prior to the to the chat here. So, yeah. Well, I mean, I have to agree because I love running sessions for this group. Um, and I, I won't say that I'm a little bit worried about <laughs> you achieving your win conditions <laughs> and then deciding it, you know, it's time to move on. Um, because prior to this, I, I have had other folks come and go, especially on the Thursday side, um, who wanted to join the campaign, you know, for six months or three months or something like that, so they could kind of get an idea of how these principles work, um, so they could take them back to their own campaign. And so, you know, I think if it comes down to it and this this session has to come to an end, um, I'm definitely going to see if there's a way I can't squeeze into some another game somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we um... I'm joining with these guys. I mean, I, I play two nights a week as it is, um, but I, I think I can rearrange my schedule if, if, the, uh, if Tuesday reaches their objective and decides they want to retire and and move on to other other experiments and other learning opportunities then uh i won't be mad um but i will be looking to uh join into join into another game well yeah i mean that and that's what's cool about um 
this community and you know we're we're kind of a niche within a niche uh with the the bro sr and all that nonsense but the um just in knowing the people that we know through uh, the various games we've been able to start up creek spiel games and we've been able to i personally have never had very much experience with war games that weren't like a computer game so um when i got introduced to that kind of stuff that was really fun and it was because i know you guys so uh, i i uh, the kind of the joke that goes around is that i'm in all these games um and if something you know if i stop playing here I, I'm, I'm gonna be right back in something else so whatever whatever it is <laughs> I'm, I'm not going anywhere <laughs> all right all right sounds good well, listen, thank you. I know we had tried to set aside 30 minutes for this, and so we're right around that spot. Um, and again, I really appreciate you guys participating in the game and also participating in this chat. Uh, is there anything else that any of you would like to add in uh, conclusion? I, I think the only thing that we haven't said that remains to be said is Tuesday Supremacy. <laughs> I'd like to say that that uh, that your take on uh, on running this game um, is very interesting. It's it's different than uh, pretty much every other DM I've I've played with, uh, and it, it's very methodical and it's very it's very thought out. And it's uh, I think your process is probably what allows you to run the two groups uh, without losing your damn mind. Uh, so I, I'm I'm very impressed by that to be able to just to just not get burnt out. I mean, how many sessions have we we missed? Maybe two or three sessions in what a year and a half. So, uh, uh, no, it's, it hasn't it's, quite been a year. And hasn't we're, quite been a year. We're okay. coming up. I think this is se session eighty one. Uh, we we missed a bunch around Christmas time, but that that's what happens. But uh, yeah, last Tuesday was number eighty, so this is eighty two. This is session eighty two, which I think is is pretty darn good. For uh, for 11 months of 10 10 and a half months yeah yeah it's been uh it's uh it's been awesome and uh we still got we still got work to do we got work to do all right well thanks everyone for participating in the chat i will be turning this into a video and putting it on the youtube channel um and i'll throw in all the good stuff uh at the end there so i'm going to go ahead and stop recording and then we will transition over